All right, good evening, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the Friday evening as it rolls on here at Nauticon. I hope you're enjoying the bar carts. I hope you're enjoying the bar carts a lot. You should buy lots of booze from the bar carts. <laughs> Sewer is, uh, I think, personally, single-handedly helping us reach our goal at the bar carts. So, uh, but if you can give him a hand, I'm sure he'd appreciate it. <clears throat> we all know Matt Neely, of course, as the Canadian singer-songwriter who has written and recorded four albums and toured <laughs> widely throughout the U.S. and Canada. We also know, of course, that he's worked extensively with producer Ben Carlstrom and has sung many albums, sung, sorry, sung many songs on the Bob Rivers Twisted Tunes albums and Man Cow Song parodies. Tonight, he is the Nauticon Mythbuster. I'll try not to break out into song, but some parts of this are better sung. So uh, depending on what strikes me, we might go into a musical mode here just to help liven things up, a little West Side Story, maybe Cats, we'll see. Thanks everybody for coming out today. Uh, today we're going to do a little bit of Nauticon Mythbusters, basically looking at the um, urban legend that data is stored on hotel keys, analyzing that legend using MagStrip analysis tools, then I'll move into some advanced MagStripe uh, discovery techniques. First, a little spiel about me, uh, manager of profiling team at Secure State. I basically manage a group of hackers. If people saw uh, Relic or Dave Candy's talk, he's actually my boss. Uh, if you look online, you'll find some scary pictures of us. Um, and actually, if you download the recent Security Justice podcast, you'll find a scary picture of us. Um, areas of experience, do a lot of stuff with wireless, pen testing, physical security, security convergence, all sorts of fun stuff. Spoken at places like ShmooCon, DEF CON. Outside of work, do the Security Justice podcast. If you're looking for a new podcast to tune into, check out Security Justice. Also help run the new InfoSec Forum. If anyone's a local person looking for a security group, look up the new InfoSec Forum on the web. It's a free security group that I help run in town. Great resource. With that, basically, uh, today we're going to look at this email, which you might have seen in different forums, basically stating that uh, personal data is stored on hotel keys, that um, your you know, credit card number, home address, name, all different information is stored on hotel keys for when you check in, and therefore you should not leave this information behind. You should always take the cards with you, always destroy them. I first uh, you know, saw this floating around, was kind of interested in it. I actually investigated it when I was at a previous employment, and the head of our executive protection force basically came up to me and said, hey, this email's going around online about not being able to leave hotel keys around because it contains personal information. Um, do we need to worry about this when the executives travel? I said, well, I have some ideas on it, but to test it, I need to buy some gear. And they said, well, how much would it cost? I said, well, a uh, you know, reader writer is about $200. Um, you know, so we need at least one of those to be able to test it. And they said, okay, great, you know, buy three of them just in case we break some. So you know, great part of being in the corporate security area is you know, 600 bucks to a company is you know, not much. So with that, that kind of got me started in looking at MagStripe cards. And the reader writers have actually come in very handy uh, during pen tests, especially physical assessments, when looking at what's at cards or assessing uh, you know, kiosks that take input through cards. So to help look at this uh, myth, we're going to first do a brief introduction to MagStripe cards. We're going to talk about what is a MagStripe card, how is data encoded onto the card, uh, and those type of standards that go into it. Next, going to go over tools that can be used to read the cards. I'll talk about a free tool as well as a commercial tool and discuss some of the advantages to both of them. Uh, so folks can leave here and start reading their own cards. Uh, also talk about the hardware required, since this does actually have a hardware component, talk about that as well. Talk about how I tested the myth, uh, view the results, discuss the results, and then we'll move on to some advanced techniques. So what is a MagStripe card? Basically, a MagStripe in the classic term is usually made up of a bunch of ISO standards. There's one that defines the physical characteristics of the card, so how big it is, how the corners are rounded, how flexible the card is where the stripe is located. The other ISO standard that's generally used outlines three tracks for the cards as well as coercivity. Uh, coercivity is something you hear mentioned when you look at writers. Uh, there are basically two different types, which depends on how strongly the data is written to the card. For the most part, if you're just reading, it doesn't matter if it's a high-co or a low-co card. For writers, it's, it's cheaper to come across low-co writers than high-co writers. But if you have a system which only, you know, which, say you have a client that uses high-co cards, you want to forge them, you can forge them with a loco reader, and uh, the reader basically can't tell the difference between the two of them. The card will just get damaged quicker. Basically, a loco card requires less magnetic energy to encode the data onto the card. So if it's an industrial environment, for instance, airports, um, 
manufacturing plants, like uh, automotive manufacturing plants, will use high cards because they're around a lot of big motors, a lot of equipment that puts out a lot of electromagnetic radiation and that can mess up a mag strike card. So a high code card will be harder to mess up. So if you do make a low code card for that environment, it'll just work for a day or two, then stop working, but usually that's all you need to get yourself in the door for a pen test. For more information on that, there's actually a um, post on my blog where I talk about in more depth about what the difference is between high code and low code. There's also a series of posts I have, which I'm presently working on. At the end, there'll be a link to my blog, so if any of this interests you, go over there, check out the uh, tagline for MagStripe cards, you'll find out more information. Uh, the third one is how data is encoded onto, the third ISO standard is how data is encoded onto a financial services card. And basically, the banking industry, being the banking industry and coming up with standards, came up with standards with how data is encoded onto ATM cards. And basically, that standard has been adopted by the majority of folks in terms of how data is encoded onto MagStripe cards. Uh, gift cards, even ID cards, a lot of those still use the same format set up by the banking industry. So despite the fact that it's banking specific, it applies to a lot of different areas. Now here you can see on the card there are actually three tracks of data. The first track is the highest on the card, second track is the next lowest, and third is the next lowest. So it's key to remember there are three different tracks. And each track has a different format that is standard to them. Um, again, these are just based off of the ISO standard. Some manufacturers try to get tricky and develop high security cards, where basically they invent their own standard, or I've even seen manufacturers that simply just move track three to track two. And a lot of stupid readers, um, the chip in them will only recognize track two data on track two. So unless you get their proprietary reader, it won't work. So we'll discuss, of the tools that we have, how we can get around that. But for the most part, um, the uh, first track uses a character set, which is basically a seven-bit character set, which covers alphanumeric, alphanumeric characters and a couple special characters. Uh, there's the sentinel bit, which is a percent sign. Then you have X amount of alphanumeric data. The uh, up caret is the divider between the fields. You can have as many fields and up carrots as you can fit into the um, 75 alphanumeric characters. Then you have a question mark, which signifies the end of the strip, and then uh, LRC value, basically a checksum. So when you read the card, it reads in the data, computes a checksum. If the checksum matches what's on the card, you knew it read it correctly. Because mag stripe cards can be damaged, most of them have a checksum in there to basically make sure the card's been read correctly. Track two, very similar. In this case, it just uses 40 numeric characters. Um, different uh, grouping on, on the bit rate, slightly different. Um, Special characters, but similar type of format. You have a sentinel bit, data, dividers, uh, close, and then an LRC. Track three, which is actually called the thrift track, developed for the thrift industry. Um, same type of thing as track two, but just a lot more dense. So you can fit a lot more information onto a track two track. Uh, because of that, it's not used as much because with the data being that close together, it's a bit easier to damage. But you will find cases where track two is used um, in some applications, and actually, or sorry, track three is used in some applications. And oddly, track three is actually really popular in access control systems. If I had an access control system card that is a MagStrip card, most likely you're gonna have track three data. Um, part of that's also done because most other cards don't use track three. So a company might have a um, you know, company card which has three tracks on it. The first two tracks are actually a company debit card, which they can swipe through the point of sales you can, you can buy stuff in the cafeteria or whatever. And a third track, which isn't used by the point of sales, is the access control system. So now we have just a, a general overview, a couple of different tools that can be used to look at the cards. The first tool is Stripe Snoop. The big advantage of Stripe Snoop is it's free. Uh, so you really can't beat on the price. Supports a lot of different operating systems. Uh, but it has some limitations. One of the limitations is it pretty much cannot parse non-standard formats. So basically, you swipe the card, and the reader that you need to make for this, or you can buy a reader that is compatible, the decoding of the strips is done inside the reader. So the reader sees the format and basically spits out the standard data format. So if you're trying to read a card that's written on some sort of proprietary system, unless you get a hold of one of their readers, you're not gonna be able to read it, because the card's gonna be expecting track two data on track two um, with ABA character set formatting, so if they change away from the standard formatting, Stripe Snoop is probably not gonna be able to read it. Other downside of Stripe Snoop is, if you have three stripes on a card, you need to be able to identify, um, basically, unless you get a three-headed reader, uh, and if you do that, you're gonna need to have three inputs into the computer. 
basically Stripe Snoop can accept input from parallel port, serial port, and if you have a game port for some god awful reason, still a game port. So if you need to read data from all three tracks, you actually need to have those three interfaces hooked in, so it gets a little crazy in terms of having three inputs into your laptop. Or more commonly, you'll have this reader here does, tri tri uh, sorry, does track one, this does track two, this does track three. So you plug in the first one, swipe it for track one, unplug it. Plug in the second one, swipe it for track two, unplug it. Plug in the third one, swipe it for track three, unplug it. A little time consuming if you need to go through 50 cards. But it's free, it gets your job done. It also has a really neat ability. It has actually a database built into it that'll try to identify the type of card being used. And if you can identify it, it'll then tell you this is a driver's license, this is a credit card, and it'll actually parse the data on the card based off of that information. And I have some information, uh, some screenshots that are coming up. And that's kind of a neat feature in terms of uh, they detect some student IDs, some other information. Um, so that's a cool little feature of it. Reader options, you can either build your own. Basically, if you go to any of the cheap electronic warehouses, buy a TTL card reader, which are usually like two, three bucks, get a TTL to serial or um, parallel converter, plug in your computer, you can read it that way. Or a lot of point of sale keyboards that are out there, um, Stripe Soup is compatible with as well. So there are some cheap build options if you're DIY, or you can buy a pre-made reader for you know, 50 bucks off of eBay. Some of the track information that we see here, uh, this is a card that I swiped, which is actually a credit card, or this is a driver's license. Um, because it's my driver's license, I blocked out some of the data um, for some odd reason. Uh, yeah. Um, so it goes through, reads the data, it shows you the raw output up here, then it shows you actually what the card format is, and it's based off of, you can see the start sentinel divider, and then it tells you it's possibly a uh, North American driver's license, and then it parses the data, so it knows this number here means state of Ohio, license number, date, and sometimes the date format switched around, like the date is actually um, year, month. So it helps parse it out for you, which is, which is pretty cool. Here's an example of a credit card. Actually uh, does a similar type of thing, parses it out. So the database feature is pretty cool. If you come across a card, you're not sure what it is. You can swipe it. If it's in the database, it'll tell you. Um, one thing is the database is fairly outdated. It hasn't been updated in a number of years. But still a pretty cool feature, and it's free, so you really can't beat the price. Max Stripe is the uh, commercial tool, which I uh, use, highly recommend, um, but it is pricey. Uh, it's about 200 euro, which depending on how the euro and the dollar is doing, um, can change. Uh, right now, you know, luckily the euro is actually tanking, so the conversion rate's getting a little bit better. Uh, about a year ago when the dollar was into crapper, um, the price on the, these was pretty high because it's almost two to one dollar to euro. This is a USB device. It is a reader-writer. Um, the older versions use a parallel port. You'll be able to find them on uh, eBay. If you can, the parallel port versions work just fine. That's actually what I use myself. Um, they support uh, NT, Windows 2000, Vista, all sorts of uh, different stuff. They even support uh, Windows Mobile. And it provides code on a site to write your own Windows Mobile clients. It can read all three tracks at once. And the really neat feature of the card is the reader basically reads the data off the track and sends the raw data to the software. So the software can show you the raw output. So if it's a non-standard format, you can get that data from the card and begin to analyze it. So you can analyze non-standard formats with Stripe Snoop pretty easily. Uh, it also has some pretty cool uh, data analysis and visualization tools I'll talk about later. Um, other really cool feature, it's a card writer. So if you get a card, you want to modify it, want to make your own cards, this device can do it. Uh, it also has some neat features to automatically regenerate the checksum. If you start manipulating a card, regenerate the checksum, so it'll still be valid when it's read. Uh, in my opinion, it's the best reader to look at for non-standard card mag stripe reading. If you're going to do anything with it professionally, it's well worth the price. Excellent product. So a couple of examples. Here's a binary decode. Basically shows you the binary uh, data and just does a straight um, parsing of the tracks by the, the standard format. Tell you the character set being used, if the LRC values match up, if the parity values match up. Same card in character format, or basically parses it down by the uh, character set. And then it'll actually break it down by the ISO set. So a couple of different ways to decode it. 
Uh, for custom cards, it's the uh, binary format is, is very nice, but it's fairly flexible in terms of how it can display data. And as I mentioned, it also has a writer, which is really awesome when you get into actually wanting to manipulate these systems. So now we know how we can read the cards, talking about testing the myth. Uh, for this, I um, grabbed approximately 25 hotel keys. Uh, if anyone's interested in the data, I can probably put it up online later. Um, you can uh, email me about it, or I can put up my blog if there's enough uh, requests for it. I grouped the cards by um, hotel and room number. Um, so that way we can look at, you know, three cards from the same hotel for, you know, the same room, or, you know, six cards for the same hotel, two for each different types of room to see what sort of patterns there are. Um, read the cards multiple times. So one thing I sort of discover is that the character set's not standard, so there's no checksum that lined up. So basically, I'd swipe it multiple times, and if I got multiple reads that were the same pattern, I was fairly certain it was reading correctly. Uh, that's also why I limited it to 25 cards, because I was swiping each of them a couple of times, like three or four times. So after, you know, swiping, you know, about 100 card swipes, you know, it just starts to get old. Um, but limited down to 25 just for, you know, representative sample. And then we started to analyze the results. So here's the first example. We don't really need to look at the data. Um, but just to show you, again, this is on track three, unknown format. Um, you know, in this case, a bunch of binary data because it can't actually parse it. Another example, track two. And we have a third example, which is on all three tracks. And we'll be coming back to this one a little bit later. But the vast majority of the hotel keys I looked at, all the data was on track three. Very few had data on track one and two. So next, start to analyze the results. First thing I saw is that every single hotel key had data on track three. Some had data on additional tracks. Um, as I mentioned, some data was encoded between multiple tracks. In most cases, if it was encoded between multiple tracks, it looked like the same data encoded across three tracks. Not a standard character set. Wasn't anything that was ALFI or uh, BCD, so not, not the standard ISO character sets. Uh, I tried a bunch of different groupings to try to get a valid checksum, so tried different um, bit groupings and other things to try to generate a valid checksum uh, with valid parity bits. was not actually able to do that. And the interesting thing I found is that the data varied greatly between two cards, even for the same room. Um, there was one exception I actually found, uh, two cards for the same room that were off by just 28 bits. So most of the cards, if I looked at them for the same room with three different cards, very, very little was similar. So there's some sort of encoding, or I hate to say encryption because knowing the products here, probably not any sort of strong encryption, but there's some sort of really funky encoding going on here in terms of the data. Um, next up, let's look at observing the process. Uh, when we go into a hotel, there are a couple of different things that um, you'll notice. Talk to a number of hotel staff, and there tend to be two different systems. There's an old system and a new system. Old system is actually just a keypad that's not attached to anything, and when they swipe your card, they basically type in the room number and the end date. And then they swipe the card through, and that card is now activated for that room to that end date. Newer systems, it does hook up into the PC, um, so the employees are not really sure what data was sent to it. But it's pretty clear from the old system that there wouldn't be personal data on there because they're just entering in room number, uh, exit date. So looking at the results, um, from looking at the data itself, we see that, uh, one, the data is not readable in any standard format. And the email, it says, you know, you can swipe it through any reader and be able to read it. That's obviously not true because it's not even a standard format. So that begins to debunk the, the myth because if you can actually read the data off of it, you know, that would kind of be the first step. Uh, second, uh, the email claims that it stores things like um, your home address, your credit card number, your social security number. Frankly, more data than these cards can store. So that also leads you to believe it's, you know, not correct. And also, if you look back at the data, you know, even if you just look at, you know, one of these tracks, these are actually all the same. You know, there's only finite data you can store in there unless you're using some sort of crazy compression algorithm. And then looking at the process, it looks like the information is, um, you know, just being entered in by room number and leave date. Final thing I did, consulted uh, Snopes, and they basically said it was false. So based off of these things, I basically feel that this is busted. Um, isn't any sort of personal data on those cards? 
Not to say somewhere out there there isn't. Uh, for instance, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if like Disney World for some odd reason would actually put data on the cards because they like to track everything about people or a casino wouldn't. But the average hotel definitely isn't storing personal data on the card. Um, and if they are, it's not in any sort of standard format. So, you know, you can leave those cards, you can take them. Uh, interesting story of something that led into why this myth was potentially perpetuated is in uh, Las Vegas, they were busting hookers. Uh, and they noticed the hookers had on them like 50 hotel room keys. And they expected that these hotel room keys were just, you know, for, you know, business expenses. Um, but they started to look at the hotel keys and noticed that um, a couple times they were busting them, they were using them as credit cards. And they go up to a pump and basically pay out a credit card. And ends up what they were doing is there was uh, folks in town that were stealing credit card numbers. And then instead of encoding them onto credit cards, just encode them onto room keys because it's the same exact format. You can still encode the data onto it because, you know, hookers have lots of extra room keys. Um, so in Vegas, there were hookers running around with hotel keys with credit card numbers on them, but that wasn't uh, because the hotel was putting it on there. It was just a nice way to commit credit card fraud. Uh, so that's a potential for how this myth got, got perpetuated. But for the most part, pretty much busted. So with that, we'll move into some more of the advanced techniques, which is where it gets, uh, gets fun in my eyes. Stripe Snoop has some signal analysis techniques where it actually show you the data that's on the card. You can do your own groupings where this, you can highlight it. It'll tell you what the character set is. Uh, if you can have a writer, you can modify it. Nice to be able to look at custom data sets and be able to you know, pick out patterns, try different groupings. It's a nice visual representation of the card, which is helpful for signal analysis. Uh, additionally, on the card, on the reader, you'll see this window over here. This is actually the uh, tick number to duration. And this can actually be handy for looking at how the card is encoded. Most cards you're going to see are going to have two lines of some sort. And that's going to be encoded in the standard MFM format. There are basically two ways to encode data onto a card, MFM and FMM. Uh, if it's two stripes, it's MFM. And pretty much any reader writer can read and write that card. There's a company in Germany that makes cards that are uh, FMF. If you see three strips, you know that's the case. Stripes or um, Mackie interface can read these cards. They can't actually write them. But you might occur, encounter these on access control systems. Some vendors use that as a copy protection mechanism of sort. You can also start looking at the cards. You want to see two fairly close stripes. If you start to see ones that are starting to diverge or here where it almost looks like three stripes, and that card got exposed to some sort of magnetic field, which is throwing off the tick rate. So that card will probably take multiple times to read. So it's kind of a neat little thing. If you're doing a sort of troubleshooting on a system, you can read the card, figure out if the card is or isn't working for whatever reason. <clears throat> Data analysis engine. This is handy for non-standard formats. You can basically start doing different parity and grouping. It'll automatically run the checks. If it comes back as all parity screen, you found how the character set is grouped. You can start then doing some manipulation. Uh, when I do a lot of analysis, I actually just have some Perl scripts I run that parse through all different combinations because it's really boring to sit here and do each pull down, hit go, pull down, go. Just have a Perl script that runs through and does it. Um, but it's a nice way to be able to, again, if you have a custom card, you want to figure out the format, you can start to figure out how the characters are grouped and manipulate stuff. Another neat feature, there's a graph at the top that basically shows you how, where each track is written. You see you have track one, two, and three, different colors. This card up here, their tracks are written at basically the same time. So when you read them, the data is coming in at the same rate. This card down here has tracks written at different times. So this implies that either that card is used in a rewrite fashion. For instance, most cards just have a reference number on them. So when you, you know, go to a subway and swipe them, it just queries the back end system, says, does this person have money on the card? Yes, and lets it go. Other cards, when you swipe, it'll actually rewrite it on the fly. So if you see multiple writes, it's a sign there's some sort of rewriting on the fly, especially if it's not a nice smooth line. That was probably someone swiping it through. If it's a machine done one, it's going to be nice and smooth. So I can help tell you how it was rewritten. Also, if you see multiple stripes, it's a sign that potentially you have three different systems in play here because they are written at different times. So again, handy to start figuring out what's on the card, how that information is gathered, and where it can come into play. Something I recently started playing with is a product called Magnetic Developer. Really cool stuff. Um, pretty expensive, though. It's $44 for a little two-ounce bottle. Um, but it's a little dropper. And basically, when you put it over the card, it visually displays the data on the mag stripe, uh, which is 
pretty cool stuff. And then when you're done, you can either just wipe it off, the card's reusable, or if you need to store it, you can put, um, a lot of people I see use packing tape. They put packing tape over it so you can still preserve the pattern. Yeah. You can do that with fine iron filings, more like a dollar Yeah, good tip. So, yeah. So find some fine iron filings and that would work far better. Our results pretty though. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know, actually. I have not tried it. Our results is pretty. Probably depends on how fine iron, how fine the filings are, but I would be willing to bet that's actually all this stuff is. It's basically stored in, uh, you shake it up, it's some sort of filings inside of uh, basically a fluid that dissolves really fast. So you pour it on and it basically dissolves and leaves the filings behind. Here are some examples of the different cards. You can see the little stripes here. This is a two track card, uh, one track, and so on. We'll take a look at them in a little bit more depth. Here's uh, one wide track. Remember one of the cards we looked at before, had data on all three tracks. This is actually just one really wide track. Two track card, and actually if you zoom in on it, you can get a fair amount of detail. Uh, I haven't tried, but you could probably start to decode that by hand if you were really that anal. Um, but helpful just to see what's on the card. It also can be useful to see if a card's been damaged. And then here's a, most of the hotel keys are actually just half a card, which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, the strip doesn't run the full length of it. Also, you can see if a card has been rewritten multiple times, you can start to see um, where the tracks kind of overlap because they don't always rewrite the exact same area. So that can be handy, again, if you're looking at a card that's been rewritten. Uh, you can get some clues visually from that as well besides just looking at how the tracks are written to the, to the device, to the card. Okay, so some applications of this. Uh, a couple of places I've used this while penetration testing. Um, one big one is access control systems. Um, there are still people that use MagStrip cards for access control systems. Uh, if you can get a hold of one of those cards and read it, uh, then you can start to manipulate that card and potentially be able to gain access to the building. A couple of interesting things that I've seen, these are just general formats because each system runs a little bit differently. I didn't want to take a card from an actual system I used because some of them, information was gotten through NDAs and other things, so it can't necessarily release them but you'll see a general format like this. You usually see a site number and a badge number, and this is for essentially managed system. So there's some server at the company that when you swipe your card, the reader talks to a central server or has a database on it that basically says this card number can or can't get into this door. For the most part, you have a site code and then the badge number is unique to the user. So if you get a hold of someone's card or get their site code, you can then start making your own badges. You can replicate the badge that person has, but let's say you get a low-level person that just has access to your front door, you want to get access to the data center. If you have a lot of time, um, you could start fuzzing the badge number, basically just trying other people's badge numbers. For the most part, the site code does not change between uh, systems unless you had some sort of strange merger of two companies. Um, so the badge number is something to focus on there. Uh, you could also look at things like using a lower down badge number, because generally, um, especially if it's a new system, they're going to issue the you know, the guard and administrative badges first, then the higher up ones. For standalone systems, uh, where it's just basically a card reader on a door, doesn't really talk to anything, you generally see a format that looks something like you have a site code again, a building code, an access code, which could be a room code, or just code one gets you into these doors, code two gets you into these doors, activation date and end date. Uh, with this, you can try modifying different values, you know, to room, know what the different values are, but, um, you know, if you know building, you want to get into this building over here, you know that's building four, you can try that. But something I found in some of these systems that works, which is kind of cool, if you change them to common wildcards, like 255 uh, is one that I've seen used a lot, zero and one, they basically act as wildcards. So get a hold of a card at a site. Basically, we don't touch the site code, because that's the same. And we change the building code to 255, the access code to 255, and it now works on every single door. Um, so that's kind of fun. Then you don't really need to change around the activation data or other things. Um, so something to try out if you do get a hold of one of the cards in the format, try changing them around. So you try those common values of a 0, 1, and 254, or 255. Um, and you'll be surprised some of the systems that actually do allow you in. 
If you're interested in access control systems with MagStripe readers, I'd recommend checking out this white paper. Basically a thesis that some folks did on attacking uh, card systems. They especially made a neat little device which basically plugs into the reader. There's a picture of it. Goes to a little handheld to basically tell it the card number and just spits it in so you don't need to rewrite the card. Um, one of the research projects I would like to actually try to build one of those, but keep posted on that. But if you're interested in this stuff, I highly recommend reading this white paper that gives some information on how those systems work, potential weaknesses, and ways to attack them. The other area that I've uh, used these cards is in um, looking at kiosks. So a lot of companies are going over to kiosks, and if they take any sort of input from a MagStripe writer, uh, sometimes you can elicit interesting results by feeding the MagStripe writer data it's not expecting. Because some programmers today know that you should sanitize all inputs that's given to the application. Um, but even when they sanitize stuff from the keyboard and other areas, uh, I've found some cases where they don't sanitize inputs from the MagStripe reader because they're thinking, well, who the heck's going to provide any sort of garbage data through there? So some interesting formats to look at. One, actually making cards with longer tracks. You can actually start splicing cards together. So you get something that's longer than um, the normal character set. So on track one, more than 80 characters. Track two, more than 40 characters. Track three, more than 107 characters. And I've seen some cases where you can do this. It's a swipe through type kind. You swipe it through, the machine crashes. Um, so definitely something you're going to want to look at in terms of, you know, are you doing a buffer overflow? What sort of instability is being caused in this system? Additionally, I've had some luck with mangled card formats. Uh, a couple of things that I try in my a uh, list of, you know, kind of standard check cards I have. Um, just, you know, come up with some crazy formats, make these cards, keep them in your set, try them when you're looking at a kiosk. Uh, the first one is just a start bit and just a ton of um, divider bits between different sections. Contains no data, see how the application responds. The second one's one I've actually had some luck with, where I've seen some applications where it has a sentinel bit that does the caret, has data, caret, and um, then the field divider. And I found if you just do the caret, so the application's not expecting data, and you close it off, you can really confuse something. And have caused, again, some stability issues, which shows a sign there's something going on. In most of these cases, um, in fact, in all the cases, we never really looked at making actual exploits on the cards. Because a lot of times, you're really doing it blind. You run it through, it crashes. So it's just something to bring back to developers of saying, hey, you're not sanitizing input here, where you could crash the device. They usually work on then sanitizing that input and fixing it. Um, but, you know, interesting area to check into when looking at kiosks and other devices. Another interesting thing is adding fields on the cards. You know, if there's room on the MagStripe strip, add in some extra data, see what happens. So, fuzzing cards, interesting thing to do a lot of looking at kiosks or other formats. And with that, my laptop. Oh, there we go. So with that, uh, we'll basically take it on to questions. Uh, if folks have interest in secure state or need any assessments, check out our website. Next one down is my blog. I have some posts up on this. We'll be doing some more posts on this subject. Uh, coming up, I have something in-depth post on Stripe Snoop. Then we'll be really digging into uh, Mackie Interface. And I should say, I don't get any um, you know, royalties from Mackie Interface. They just make really awesome products. Additionally, if you want to play with smart cards, they have some really cool smart card products as well. And there's my email address. Yeah. Iron Geek. Thanks, Matt. I have kind of an odd question. Um, most of these cards, or at least a lot of these cards, have a little like tracking ID on it, and it checks with a back-end database to actually get all the real data. Yeah. It's basically there just to, as a placeholder. Have you tried doing any like SQL injection using those uh, fields? I have. The biggest trick is um, you don't have a single tick. It's not a valid character uh, on the MagStripe card formats. Now, I may have missed it, but you were mentioning earlier that it's not like a common character set. What character set is it using? Is there any kind of name for the standard that it's using? Yes, yeah, so we'll go back to the... Okay, so depending on the track, we basically... Um, track one, alphanumeric characters, and then these are the special characters that are allowed. Then just numeric, here are the special characters that are allowed, and numeric, here are the special characters that are allowed. So there's no single tick that's in that character set. Most of the special characters that are non-alphanumeric are um, used for things like uh, field dividers or start sentinels and sentinels. It would be possible if they're doing some sort of uh, you know, very poorly coded 
uh, SQL queries. For instance, I've seen SQL injection to um, a MySQL database where you don't need a single tick. You can just slap in, uh, you know, select in your statement and it'll actually run it. Um, so that would be a potential in these cases if, you know, the stars align just right. But classic SQL injection where you get a single tick um, wouldn't be possible because of the, the character set. Okay, thanks, Matt. Sure. Yeah, Roquelin. Hi, I have a question about the hotel keys. Yeah. You said you busted it because you can't swipe it through the reader and have it spit yeah. out all of your information. Did you ever make sense and parse anything out of the data that, the, that any of the hotel cards gave you? No. Um, that's something that's kind of, I got through that um, in terms of project time I had. Um, basically decided to look at other things because when I do penetration tests, very few people pay us to break into hotel rooms. Um, so the other stuff is stuff I can look at on work time where someone's usually paying me for it. Um, but you know, if I retire or win the lottery, that would be a project I'd like to look into because I would be very curious to know how that is encoded just because uh, most of the hotel keys come from the same manufacturer. So if you figure that out, probably work on most hotels. Um, so that would be a cool little project. And if anyone is interested in that, I mean, that'd be something that, you know, could be a good online project of basically people start gathering up hotel keys, you know, sending the data in online somewhere, telling the hotel, the room number, check in, check out date, see if anyone could break it. Um, Major Malfunction actually did a talk on mag stripe analysis, and he actually referenced a, a specific format in that talk for hotel keys. Um, I've yet to see that format anywhere in the States. Now, he's actually from Europe, so it might be that, that the system in Europe uses that format. Um, but it would be curious to see what actually comes out of, you know, if there's any way to decipher the format. Because there has to be. I mean, these devices are, you know, pretty crappy, you know, little embedded devices that have very little memory. So it has to be something fairly simple. It's just a matter of finding time to look at it. Thank you. Sure. Thank you again, unless, is there anyone else? Slightly off topic to hotels, but still on the MagStripe uh, subject matter. Have you done any looking into like student ID cards that different universities use? Because nowadays they're using these cards for also paying for vending machines yep. at the bookstore and all that. Yeah, that's actually, um, have done some looking there. Um, what I've found is that actually it's pretty common to have multiple systems. So for instance, track one might be the, the track that contains student ID number and other information that's used by the payment system. So when you swipe at the point of sales term, it reads track one. Track two controls the general access control system for campus. So you track two is red, and that'll open up the door to the building. And then track three is used by the actual get into your room. And you'll see that at corporate campuses as well, because a lot of corporations are going over to, same thing as colleges, where you can go into cafeteria, pay with your ID. So there'll be actually three divergent systems that each have their own track on the card. But usually it's not data you can manipulate on the card to actually change anything. It's still a reference ID that goes back and talks to a back-end database to actually find out the real data. Correct. Um, a key that most systems just have a reference ID that goes into a back-end system. Uh, a sign that you might have a system that's rewriting data is if you have a reader that sucks in your card and then spits it back out, especially if you have a system that sucks it in and like shimmies it back and forth and spits it back out. <laughs> that's most likely doing a rewrite on it. Because an actual rewrite on when you swipe something to read and rewrite at the same time is a pretty difficult task. Because one thing, if you get Stripe Snoop or a Mac, Mac Stripe writer to write it, it does take some practice to swipe it at a constant speed. And most of the high-end ones actually have a motor that feeds it through at a constant speed. So if you had anyone that went up and swiped the card and you tried to rewrite it, it did any sort of jerking motion or change of speed, it wouldn't rewrite. So generally, if you have a system that reads it and rewrites it, it's going to suck it in and then spit it back out to you, but that's fairly rare. Thanks. And I think there's someone else being hidden by the light. Um, transit cards have mag stripes with usually a bit different physical format. Do they use the similar encodings? I've actually done very little looking at transit cards because the, well, Cleveland has a public transit system, but when I use it, I don't use a pass. So don't come across them too much. Um, but they, I'm not sure what character set. There were some talks at Hope, uh, I think, three or four Hopes ago on the MetroCard system that probably had some good data on it. Uh, but that's just something I haven't really, haven't really looked at. Yeah. 
Any other questions? Okay, no, thank you for coming out. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to come up to me later.